they're getting really close to nailing that time period. Just like in baseball and in football, you play to get to the Super Bowl. You play to get to the World Series. It's not given to you. Do you know how much they paid Jesse the Body Ventura? The first thing she says to me, she gets in the car, she goes, we need to stop at a liquor store. There's no question about it. The fans believe in this Cody Rhodes. All of a sudden, Randy reaches in his pocket, pulls out a little bag. Ten minutes later, it looks like a Cheech and Chong movie. What's good, everybody? Welcome into yet another episode of your favorite WWE Pro Wrestling Storytime show. We like to call it Behind the Turnbuckle with Coach Ed Carlucci. My man, Big Tommy C, is over there. I am the coach. And Tommy, yet again, as we head into the last couple of weeks before WrestleMania, a lot happening with at least the major storylines. Hello, sir. How are you, sir? And yes, it did. And uh, our boy Rock kicked it off on SmackDown. And Cody came on the other end on Raw. And it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to be happening in the next couple of weeks. And we're right here to tell you all about it. And that's exactly where we're going to start. If you've never seen this show before, combined almost 45 years inside the WWE. We tell a lot of stories. We have story time. We take what's happening on Raw or SmackDown and kind of bring it back to when really the great times like 1999 to 2003 when storylines and characters were everything. And Tommy, I think they're getting really close to nailing that time period, which has fans salivating over what's happening next, at least some. So let's start. Yes, The Rock came back on Friday, but I want to start with Cody Rhodes because last week you and I were very critical about what they decided to do with the crying and sitting down with Michael Cole and all of that. This week they went completely the other way. It was a pissed off Cody Rhodes talking directly to The Rock. Did you like it? I loved it, Coach. As you know, we were the first one of the first ones to comment about the crying thing and the emotion and getting all the fans on his side. This week, a completely different Cody. He's pissed off. He jumped in Rock's face. He He's calling him out. And that's the Cody Rhodes we're looking for going towards WrestleMania. He, is, he looks very focused right now, Coach. I have to admit that. So you and I both agreed that he is not the strongest on the mic. But if you're not the strongest on the mic, because I will die on this ledge, that if you cannot talk, you cannot get completely over. He is over. There's no question about it. The oh, yeah. fans believe in this Cody Rhodes. They believe in this two-year-long storyline that everybody hopes ends at WrestleMania, and he takes the company into the next year or whatever it's going to be. But when I have that crying Cody in the back of my head, and then you bring Paul Heyman out, and I like the fact that Paul was there on Monday Night Raw, Tommy, because – you can't have Roman just can't work every week. He can't travel every week. It's not healthy for him after he's overcome cancer. So doing a lot of what they're doing, but is it going to get to a point where the rocks promos are so good and so heavy and heavy as in time that it kind of overshadows everybody else? Uh He's very entertaining though, coach. God, I mean, I, I can listen to him. I mean, the things he cut on Instagram, 20 minutes, I was riveted. Like, I didn't want to shut it off. So yeah. I think he does go overboard a little bit, but it's so interesting, and it keeps you riveted to him, watching him and what he's talking about. He's incredible. Just Friday night alone, Coach, uh, yeah. in Memphis, he went from baby face to heel, and the crowd loved it. How many guys, you superstars, do you know can do that? maybe Austin, and that's about it. He had them in the palm of his hand. He had Memphis in the palm of his hand. When total babyface, when a little heel came back to babyface, and they loved every minute of it. And by the way, it was entertaining as hell. It was unbelievable. But here's where I think there is some truth, because you know I hate social media. Uh, I don't read headlines on social media, especially wrestling Twitter, as I call it, because they believe everything that you, that you read. But yeah. Brian Gerwitz, who is Rock's right hand, he's Rock's writer, he responded to a tweet this week. So that's how I know there has been some discussion. And the tweet was basically that the Rock segments are going way too long. And Brian said, no, that was within 30 seconds of what we allotted for that segment on SmackDown, which tells me they allotted a lot of time for that yeah. on SmackDown. So yeah. if you're going to have the Rock here, and we now know, we, we discussed it last week, that – 
he's going to be gone as of May 1st. He's making a movie for three months. And so knowing that, then you know that WWE is pro- probably feeling the pressure to get the storyline wrapped up by WrestleMania. You got another three or four weeks to have The Rock around. Then he's gone yep. till right before SummerSlam. Right. So if that's the case and Cody's going to be the guy, as we segue into they brought Cody out for the Jay Uso, Jimmy Uso segment. And when we talk about making storylines great, when you make a personal family, that's always been the recipe. That's always been the secret sauce. And I think that's why the fans absolutely love this Jay, Jimmy Uso situation. But now you bring Cody into it, but Tommy, If Cody is so focused on The Rock and so focused on Roman Reigns, why in the world would he come out to try to save that segment? That, to me, didn't make a lot of sense, even though they tried to make it make sense. Yeah, I I think you're right about that, Coach. Uh, It did make a lot of sense, but I think he's keeping close to the vet. He knows, uh, you know, he had nobody else helping him, Jay. And uh, I know Jay has saved Cody a couple times, so he felt obligated to be there. So... Him coming out, it was a little strange, and uh, but he did what he had to do, and uh, I think Jay appreciated it. I think when they're sitting in the writers' meetings, because you and I have been in there for so many, and the show might be written at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., and then as you sit there and you have everybody weighing in on what they want to do, you could have eight or ten different opinions. And if that is the case, then maybe they decided, you know what, We've got to take a little bit of shine, or not shine, but attention off the rock situation and make Cody this big star. But when you show up multiple times on a show, when you show up, then all of a sudden, I know they got to fill three hours, which is why I still believe it should be a two-hour show. But to me, it's too much Cody then, just like they're talking about too much rock. There's only so much. Cody, to me, should be laser-focused on the rock. Come out, do the promo. That's all we see from him. That's what I would have wanted. That's what I would have wanted. Now, Rikishi, who is also part of the real bloodline, right? He disappointed me a little bit this week. And you're saying, what are you talking about, coach? Well, he was on a podcast and he was asked about which side of the fence that he falls on when it comes to two guys that are very, very close to him, Jay and Jimmy Uso. Here is what Rikishi had to say on that podcast. And so, you know, to see the uh, the steam that uh, Jay is is having – as a single career, you know, it only makes sense from a business standpoint. As if I was on the board of TKO or WWE, Mm -hmm. we'd have to go with heat, right? I would, I would feel that it'd be the best, uh, you know, business move. So Tommy Rikisi, here's what I didn't like about that is the fact that he basically pulled the curtain back. That's what this podcast is for. I would have loved for him to kind of stay in character and back a guy from a storyline point of view and not a, hey, this is going to be good for the company moving forward. What did you think about that? Yeah, I totally agree, Coach. Uh, He did pull the curtain back a little bit. He should be talking about those are his two sons. He should say it's going to be some battle. I'll Mm -hmm. be there sitting ringside. I I, I don't know who to choose, but, you know, he went on the business side of things, which Mm -hmm. I, I didn't like so much. So I don't. You know, sometimes you just give away too much and mm-hmm. then you just kill the illusion of everything. And I think, you know, they they kicked off the show for Raw. And, and these two guys, I mean, these guys are unbelievable. They're great. They really are. Mm-hmm. They can tell a story. They can work in the ring. These Samoan wrestlers and the, 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 the bloodline and the family of, of all these guys is it, just they're so creative and good mm-hmm. and they get you invested in it. And that's what we want which Rikishi didn't do, really. He talked about the business. That's what I'm saying, but he's an old-school guy. And yeah. now, now, The Rock has done this, but now what you see from The Rock now, all you see is storyline, right? That's all you see. And they might post, we saw posts where he met a, a, a little girl's family and he was really Dwayne Johnson. But when you're talking about real social media, real pie, it's all storyline right now because that's what people are buying into. So yep. I was a little disappointed with the reason, but he, he can do what he wants. And everybody yep. knows these are storylines, you write them or whatever. But the next thing I saw that kind of disappointed me is the WWE decided to do a contract sign. And you know, back in our day, we let's say that, back in our day, if you had a contract signing, you were guaranteed violence. You were guaranteed somebody's going to hit the other guy, something's going to break something. But two things I didn't like, 
Gunther should never do a long promo because he struggles with the English language. It's not his fault. It's not. But he had some words that they put into the promo that he couldn't even say. And yeah. then you're trying to build up this baby face in Sami Zayn, and he goes, I could do it again. I've done it again. And then he just leaves. And that's all it was. And it was almost nine minutes of television that the fans were wanting something, and I didn't think they got anything out of that segment. I agree, Coach. You know, he's not great on the mic skills, but he looks like a million bucks. And then you look at Sami Zayn, and he actually commented about that. I just want to go back with Sammy because yep. it, it seems to me they're leading to a storyline with Sammy, kind of like a la Rocky. And where is WrestleMania? It's in Philadelphia. Like mm-hmm. w- over a month ago, he did a, a arena interview with, they talked about Rocky a little bit. And then what happened before he went out there, he saw Chad Gable, right? Hey, mm-hmm. I want to thank you for the match. And then Chad Gable comes up and he says, well, I don't think you can beat Gunther at WrestleMania. Well, you know where that led to? Rest, uh, Rocky three. It was uh, Mickey and Rock, uh, Rocky. And he said, I don't think you could beat Clubber Lang. So are they doing something here like a, a la Rocky? Is, is Chad going to be his trainer? Because he came back after him again after he cut the promo. Am I wrong? Could be. Or- you could be. And I, I, I think this is the difficulty, Tommy, when you've been around for a long time. Because Sami Zayn has been so many different iterations of a character. And he's been the goofy guy. He's now yep. trying to be the serious guy. He's now trying to be the underdog guy. Then you got Chad Gable, who's the American hero guy. And when the fans have been watching you for so long, you got to be very, very careful not to try to overthink it. Or you've got to reinvent yourself in a major, major way. That's why it's hard. And that's why we talk about the legends that stick around for 20 or 30 years. Because it's really, really hard to do in an era where storylines mean more than anything. Back in the 80s and 90s, Tommy, when we didn't have a lot of TV, you could have a Ric Flair or a Ricky Steamboat. They didn't have to have character development because we rarely saw them on TV, right? Right. Right. And now yeah, you're right. every single week. That's yep. why I've always said have two hour shows. Less is more. But that's yep. why guys have to show up and do what The Undertaker said on this podcast recently. You got to pitch your own stuff. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. What else also isn't easy, Tommy, is what the WWE is trying to do with the women's side of things. And it was a few years ago, and I was back for a cup of coffee. And they had a big deal about the women having the main event match at WrestleMania for the first time ever. Yep. And Becky Lynch was the face of that. You had Charlotte Flair was the, was the face of that. And it was amazing. And they always said, we want to do that more. Well, they literally gave away a main event <laughs> pay-per-view match on Raw Monday night. And to give that away two weeks early, last man standing with Nia Jax, to me screamed, I need more attention on the women's division right now because of that big storyline over there. Did you feel that way? Absolutely, Coach. And as you know, in the past weeks with Becky Lynch, they're making her go through the mill a little bit. She wants to be that working champion. She had the things going on with Liv Morgan. So she's wrestled the past three weeks, I think. And then Nia's in her, you know, interfered in the match with Liv and Liv's pissed off at Becky. And then they ended up with a last woman standing match. Like Mm -hmm. they're really putting Becky through the mill to get to scratch and claw to get to WrestleMania. And what's going to happen when she faces the great Rhea Ripley. That's what they're making you think about. Like Becky's doing everything she can prior to WrestleMania. Is it enough? Or is it too much? I don't know. Man, I, 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 this is what I worried about, Tommy. This is what I worried about when we started this show five or six weeks ago. And we saw that this all, this all starts and ends with The Rock. And it's a, it's a ripple down effect. Pardon the pun, Rhea Ripley. And yeah. everybody wants their spot. And everybody deserves their spot. But back when you and I were there, WrestleMania was this thing where... You competed to get there. Then, for some reason, it evolved into, I've worked for the last 12 months. I deserve this spot. This is a thank you for what you've done for me, and you get put on the show in some capacity. I want to get back to the point where you earn your spot. 
where you say, listen, because of what I've done the last three or four months, it can't be 12 months unless you're talking about Cody. But, Tommy, it, it's now, hey, here you go. You get a spot because we need to check a box. I don't want to check a box. I want to have the hottest storylines with the hottest. And if that is if that is this, if that is Becky and Rhea, then I'm here for it. But I want to go back to that time. Everybody says, well, you don't want to. But don't you think, Tommy, it needs to be more about competition than just we need to check a box for this, for this, for this, for this? I totally agree with you, Coach. And the prime example is that is this whole tag team tournament. These are guys who probably mm-hmm. wouldn't be at WrestleMania, but they decide to put this tournament together to see who's going to be at WrestleMania to represent, you know, the tag team. So you're right. That's just a throw in where, you know, where other times like you've got to work to get to that spot, just like in baseball and in football, you play to get to the Super Bowl, you play to get to the World Series. It's not given to you. You have to earn it. And that's didn't that's not happening a lot as we see. Well, it's also two nights, and yep, when they started going to the two nights, right? And when they when the when they went away from the WWE Network model, when they went away from the pay per view model, and all of a sudden now you're delivering whatever the contract says with Peacock, and and you say, well, we got to have this this much programming. It now no longer is a pay per view. It is now WrestleMania is a part of the entire year's process. I think that's playing into this as well. Do you think that it's not a matter of do we have enough talent? They have enough talent to have the matches, but do you have enough hot storylines to warrant a two-night spectacle that now, even with the top storyline, you had to come up with some gimmick to make you think Sunday night, what are we going to see? I think it's too much. Yep. I agree, Coach. I totally agree with you. And the reason why they made it two nights, Coach, is because WrestleMania 35 was at MetLife, which I was at. Mm -hmm. The show was so long, we didn't get out of there till after midnight, and people who were going to take mass transit, they just stopped running that like at 1 o'clock in the morning. And I think that was one of the reasons why they decided to go to two nights for WrestleMania because they had so many matches that night that we didn't get out of there till almost 1 o'clock in the morning. So I think that's one of the reasons. Plus, money is part of it, too. So, you know, I'm not a big fan of the two-night thing. I'm, I'm really I'm not. not. I want to end it in one night, get it over with, and go. So, But they had to give you the hook for when you only have Rock here for a short period of time, he, he's got to be there both nights. So, mm-hmm. you know, or else people are not going to be tuning in. If Rock's there Saturday, not there Sunday, hmm, and I know it could be Cody and Roman and stuff like that, a little different story, I think. So oh, I'm so glad you just said that. I am so glad you just said that because they really got stuck on that part of the storyline. Because right now, The Rock, whether Cody wants to admit it or not, whether anybody else on the roster wants to admit it or not, he is the biggest star heading into WrestleMania. And is it a good thing that there's a 50-year-old star? You can argue that, but he is by far the most charismatic, and he's the one when they hit his music and you see those lightning bolts, man, the crowd's on their feet. They're ready to go. But if you go into a Sunday and that crowd shows up and it's however many people, 60,000, whatever, and you already know that The Rock is not going to be there, that's why I think The Rock and Roman Reigns will win on Saturday because then you have basically no rules. Am I right? I'm seeing that I agree. right. That I like totally no rules, agree. Right. I, I I I totally agree with you on this, Coach. I think Saturday they're going to go over and win, and then Sunday it's going to put again more pressure on Cody with bloodline mm-hmm. rules. Can Cody finish the story with bloodline rules? It makes the match more interesting than ever, and I totally agree with you on that point. Here's the other part that I don't know if you've thought about. Since WrestleMania is in Philadelphia, what organization, Tommy, became famous coming out of Philadelphia? ECW. So, oh, yeah. Paul, right? So, Paul yeah. Heyman was the creator of ECW. They had many, many, many of their greatest moments or lowest moments, however you want to look at it, involved chairs kendo sticks, tables, oh. the craziness. Bob wire. And all of that. And so you don't think that maybe behind the scenes just a little bit, even though Paul Heyman the last couple of years, Tommy, has become more corporate 
and you see him on all these interviews describing things that have gone on, and maybe he's becoming a softer side of Paul Heyman because uh, of everything he's been through. But I could see a scenario where if, these, if you say bloodline rules, what does that mean? What, what, what ultimately does that mean? And then Paul Heyman could step in and say, Philadelphia, this is our town. I made you. You made me. So let's put Cody through the ultimate gauntlet, ECW style. Now, yep. I, don't, I don't know if that's going to happen, but is it that far-fetched, Tommy, that it could? It could happen. You're absolutely right. They could have Cody wrestle with one hand behind his back. It's bloodline rules. So the book is open what could happen, and that's what makes you speculate even more when you tune in to on Sunday night. That's why I think they're going to go over on Saturday to make the match more interesting on Sunday. So, mm -hmm. And then with Heyman involved, EC, you have no idea. It could be tables all around the ring. Who knows? And that makes you want to watch even more. And they're going to get the hook for everybody when you see, I think they're going to win on Saturday. And then that sets up Sunday. And people are, can't wait to tune into Peacock to see what's going to happen between Cody and Roman. But, Tommy, think about this. What then happens with the Dave LaGrecas of the world, the Cody Crybabies of the world, everybody that's been invested? Because at some point, you have to pay something off. And yes. if they decide to have Roman Reigns continue as the champion after Sunday night, you, in all honesty, might have a revolt on your hands. Because wrestling fans will ride with you blindly ride with you until they be like, you know what? I, I, I need something that makes me feel good. I need something. And they just keep slapping me in the face, slapping me in the face. I don't know a scenario that you can't have Cody win on Sunday. So that also backs them into a little bit of a corner. Oh, I totally agree, coach. You know, I was the one I was thinking about. What if Roman does go over? Very interesting, right? Now the storyline yeah. gets even bigger. Okay, Cody wins the title on Sunday at WrestleMania. Where do we go from there, Coach? I think probably Roman will take a little time off. Who would be his next opponent? Seth well, Rollins? But how, but how Tommy? Right. How, how does that happen? Rock, Rock right. is gone May 1st. We right. already know that. So right. you've got so it's only three weeks that potentially yes. you could have the Rock back. Does the Rock even show up after WrestleMania? Or is he going to take some time off because he's got three months of a hard movie to film? I don't know. I think he. I think he will be gone. I, I don't think you won't see Rock after Sunday. You won't see him for a while, depending on whatever happens so. in the main event. Yeah, so. I, I have a. I have a tendency to agree with you on that too, because at some point you got to cut it off. And I think they've gotten way more out of the Rock than they originally anticipated, because I don't think they originally thought all of this was going to happen. And look, look, guys like us are talking about it for weeks and weeks and weeks, because that's right. how hot the storyline has right. been. Look, as of right now, he's off TV until the go-home week, April 1st at Raw. So he's not going to be at SmackDown Friday. Okay. And he's the next time he's showing up is on Raw, April 1st. They advertised it on Raw. So, okay. Well, there you go. There you go. There you go. And I have a feeling that show will be sold out. Just a hunch. Just, Just a, a hunch. tad. Yeah. Uh, a quick shout out before we get to our story time part of the show, uh, the UFL, which is the morphing of the USFL and the XFL, which is partly owned by the rock, uh, is about to relaunch. And I know this week that we're going back in time, but it made me think about Tommy, a guy by the name of Jesse, the body Ventura. And this is a story time show. And I'll never forget because I might be the only person walking God's green earth. That was a talent. In fact, I know I am talent on the 2001 version of the XFL and the 2021 version or 2020 version of the XFL. But do you know how much they paid? Because back in the day, Vince, who was a collaborator with NBC and Dick Ebersol, and we talk about all the time being in the right place at the right time. Do you know how much they paid Jesse the Body Ventura to be the caller commentator? on those NBC broadcasts early on? No. $100,000 a game. Get a out. A game. $1 million for 10 weeks. And I'll tell you the numbers, Tommy, because I begged, I begged to be a part of that XFL. 
So Vince and everybody else was like, all right, if you want to be, we'll make you a sideline guy. So I was a sideline guy um, with the number two team, which was JR and the King, right? So the play-by-play guys made like $10,000 a game, a tenth of what Jesse the Body made. He was by far the highest paid. Wow. The sideline guys made $2,500 a game, okay? How much do you think my own company, the guys that love the coach, how much do you think I made for doing an <laughs> XFL game back in the day? 800, 500. <laughs> Very close. Very close. One thousand dollars. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I knew I'm meeting it. up I knew with all it. these other guys. And, you know, you're never supposed to talk about money or compare contract. I mean, it was 24 <laughs> years ago, for God's sake. Right. But I made Tommy. I made one one hundredth. Yeah. One one hundredth of what Jesse the Body Ventura made for a single solitary Saturday night game. And I was on at the same time that he was. I was on the number two game. He was on the number one game. But that's kind of. And I'm not, you know me, I don't cry over spilt milk. I've told my stories. It is what it is. You got to move on in life. But man, when I think about all the stuff I did and the amount of money I didn't make, it doesn't make me bitter. It just kind of makes me laugh at this point. It was 24 yeah. years ago. You know what I mean? You know, like he's, he's making 100000 a game. It, and it was hard to work Life's not fair, coach. Sometimes it's not fair. And he was very difficult to work with from what I understand. I'll, I'll never forget Matt Vaskersian, who I love dearly. I love Matt Vaskersian. He's become one of the great baseball announcers in America, worked for Fox, MLB Network. I'll never forget, he got hired, Tommy, as the main guy. And when you've got Dick Ebersol and Vince McMahon in your ear screaming at you minute after minute after minute, you're like, you can't wait to get out of that. So it took them all of one week or two weeks to switch Matt with good old JR. And they put JR in the main game and Matt came down to work with me and King. And I'll never forget, we went out to like dinner the, the second week and you could just see, and I was just meeting him. He was like, coach, I can't even tell you. Can't even tell you how nice it is to be here. He goes, I hated it up there. This is a young kid who was on national TV, a huge opportunity. Right. But the pressure, Tommy, and, and you know this, you've heard Vince and you've heard these powerful executives. They don't give a damn nope. about anything other than what's in their mind. And that goes back all the way to the XFL. You were there back in the studio and they made you guys help with that production, even though you were wrestling guys and not football guys. Working 16 hours a day, coach. We were working 12, 14 hours to make these guys superstars when the football was just about D3 college football, as we know. We try to make stars out of these guys. You know, the only yep. one that came a really big star was the He Hate Me guy. And, uh, you know, it, it was tough. We had a lot of pressure on us. Vince yep. really wanted this to be successful, but it was just so outrageous. When you come out in the beginning and say you're better than the NFL, you're already, you're already shooting yourself in the face with that because nothing's better than that franchise and that logo of the NFL. So yeah, it was, and we it had a lot of pressure on us. And there was a lot of money that, the, that the company invested and then NBC invested. They're basically uh, partners. But the one thing I remember the most, Tommy was we want to separate the WWE and the XFL. We don't want those two things to cross pollinate. Right. Who yep. was the first person, the first talent, the first voice that you heard <laughs> On the first game, after you saw Vince, it was The Rock. The Rock. <laughs> the Rock. If you're some me- I'm like, yep. I-, I thought. We're- and-, and how they justified that was he played football at Miami. He right. played football in the Canadian Football League. You know, I'm like, but that's not who he is anymore. He's now The right. Rock. And he was yep. The Rock that we're seeing right now in 2024. Yep. You're it's absolutely crazy. right. It's crazy. All yeah. right. It is that time of the show. Speaking of Jesse, the body mentor, it's time for story time with Tommy. Tommy, where are you taking us to this week? I'm taking you back to coach to 1989 SummerSlam at the Meadowlands. And I was the driver from the 120 Hamilton studio in Stanford. Okay. This is who I had in the car with me sitting next to me in the front seat. Macho man, Randy Savage, the ref Earl Hebner, Jesse the Body Ventura, and then we had to pick Sherry Martell up at, at the hotel. So get in the car. All the guys are in there. They're all talking. I'm not saying nothing, and I'm in my suit and everything like that, trying to be prim and proper and everything. We picked this uh, the hurricane up, Sherry Martell. The first thing she says to me, she gets in the car. She goes, we need to stop at a liquor store. Now, in Connecticut, <laughs> liquor stores weren't open back then. So Uh I crossed over the line, went to Port Chester, got the liquor store. The girl got her uh, fifth of Bailey's. (laughs) She drank that 
all the way to the Meadowlands, okay? So she goes, I know I'm not supposed to drink, but I can cut a promo better than that. And then Macho Man is sitting next to me. He goes, hey, brother, you know, we got a tough one tonight. You know, we got Zeus, and we don't know how this guy's going to work, and we don't know where we're going. Zeus was from Hulk's movie, No Holds Barred. The main event was Hulk and Beefcake against Zeus and random uh, Randy Macho Man and Sherry in the oh corner. God. The secret weapon was Miss Elizabeth in Hogan's corner. She's a baby face. Her husband's a heel. We're in the car. She's drinking away. All of a sudden, Randy reaches in his pocket, pulls out a little bag. Ten minutes later, it looks like a Cheech and Chong movie. <laughs> Smoke. <laughs> Coat. I had to open the window. Smoke, because Randy was really nervous about what was going to happen. They had no idea what was going to happen, how how Zeus was going to work or anything like that. He's getting blown. I got a contact high. I was ready to go in the ring, coach. <laughs> that guy, it was crazy. It was, oh, and Jesse's God. there, there. So the money is, here's the money part of this whole deal. The, this okay. whole story is, match is over. Hogan goes over. Elizabeth's with them. I get in, get in my car. So I have to go to the Marriott uh, Meadowlands. So I got Macho Man in the front. Earl didn't ride with us. It was Jesse and Miss Elizabeth. Okay, hear me out. Okay. You know okay. the storyline. K Fabe is K Fabe. Yes. Pull yes. up to the Meadowlands Marriott. Shitload of fans in front. I'm like, oh man, I can't do this. I can't pull up and they're gonna see Macho Man and Elizabeth in the same car. So I pull, you know, half a block away. We're just far enough. So here's the money part of the whole story, coach. Okay. I park, I go to walk Miss Elizabeth to her hotel room, and Macho Man says to me, Hey, brother, you're up there more than 10 minutes. I'm going to come up there and kick your fucking ass. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> he goes, I'm not kidding. What? He goes, you're a, you bring Miss Elizabeth up there. You make sure nobody touches her. You bring her in her room. You don't even walk in the room. You open the door, bring her bags in, and you come back. But I'm timing you. And if it's more than 10 minutes, my ass is coming up there. And Jesse says to me, hey, dude, he's not kidding. He's not playing any games. You better get your butt up there and come on down. And I shit my pants, coach. It was. Oh, my God. Dude, that, that's a shoot, dude. That is a shoot. He was dead. I thought he was ribbon. I thought he was full. And then Jesse taps me because he's sitting in the back and he goes, he's not kidding. Get her up and get her out. You ever I, hear I, a story I, like I, that? I, I, no. First of all, No. <laughs> I've heard stories – that's 35 years ago, ladies and gentlemen, by yes. the way. I've heard stories about Macho Man and how protective he was of Miss Elizabeth back in the day. I didn't know it was that crazy. It was crazy. He didn't even before. trust Hogan with her. Are you kidding? I mean, the guy was – he's a walking paranoid. He, he, was, he was some kind of character. You know, I didn't really get to know him that well. I wasn't on the road back then. I didn't go on the road till 96, but I remember he used to come in the studio a couple. The dude was all business, man. And uh, he was, he, everything you heard about Macho Man and Elizabeth, that's all true, man. And I wow. was uh, firsthand in the car being a nice guy, going to walk up, carry your bags. And before I left, he made sure he told me 10 minutes oh, or less. Do, do or, and by the way, I believed him, coach. He would have came up, dude. I believed him. I, I've had other guys that were, you know, a lot of what they call agents. For those of you watching right now or listening at home, agents are kind of the old school guys that are employed by the company, and they help the, the current roster putting their matches together. So these are all guys that work with Macho Man and Hogan and uh, those guys, and they've told me stories that he would be walking backstage in arenas, and if you looked too long or whatever at yep. Miss Elizabeth, I mean – he he would he would interact with you in in a not so kind way. Let's no, put it that and, way. And by the way, wow, Sherry Tommy. was a trip. Sherry was a trip on our way down. She's drinking that Bailey's, and I had like back in the day the style of a mullet. She played oh, with the back of did. my hair. I like your hair. So, and meanwhile, I'm just trying to drive, dude. Yeah. Meanwhile, the other guy is Cheech and Chong over here. The friggin' car <laughs> is full of smoke. I'm a I'm I'm a new guy. I've only been with the company a year. I'm in a suit and I'm like I'm getting a contact high here. I'm like, oh what the? Gosh. Can you believe stuff like this happens? And it happened, Coach. And that's why we tell stories here on Behind the Turnbuckle. We got a lot of good stuff coming up. So make sure you tune in every week, everybody.
That's exactly right. After WrestleMania, we're going to start adding uh, guests to the show. So in our comments section, if there is an old school guy from 1990 to 2010 that you would like to see right here tell their stories about their time, whether it's WWE or WCW, we don't care. If you want to see somebody, put into the comment section, and we'll try to contact them and bring them on. We plan on being here for many, many, many years to come. So we've got a ton of stories to tell. But right here, right now, we're just two weeks away from what should be a very, very interesting WrestleMania. And the last episode before WrestleMania, it's going to be all WrestleMania stories. We're going to take you back. How how many did you? I went to 16 WrestleManias. How many have you been to? You remember? I started WrestleMania four. I did five. I missed a couple in between, but my last one was 35 uh at MetLife Stadium in 2019 and then COVID came and then you know I got let go from the company so I've I've been to a lot of WrestleManias a lot off and on for 31 years you went to WrestleMania yeah wow we're going to talk about what the day was like how long the day the Uh, rehearsals some of the best rehearsal we ever seen Limp Biscuit uh, playing the Undertaker's theme song in Seattle how I was the guest referee and we had to practice having the Miller like catfight girls attack me oh that really i I can't even believe after after being at espn and all these places after that i look back at some of the videos and i can't even believe some of the stuff that i did but that's called living tommy and we have lived we have lived that's what it's all about all yep. right, that's going to do it for this week's episode. Hopefully, y'all enjoy it. Hit that like button for us. It really helps the show grow. And we drop an episode every single week, normally on Fridays and or Saturdays. But the easiest way, subscribe to our YouTube channel, turn on those notifications. And every single time we drop a short, a reel, a full video, you will be notified. For yep. my man, Big Tommy C, I am the coach. We'll see you next time right here on Behind the Turnbuckle.